Hello, hello. Today I am here with Meg McInerney, who is the co-creator of Slept the Play and co-founder of The Arts Effect. And uh, Meg, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Meg. Um, and I'm so excited to be here to talk to you about our play Slut. Um, and thank you to the entire University of Michigan community and Basement Arts um, for your strength and leadership in putting on this play. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, can we start off with, um, just tell me a little bit about the process of devising Slut, creating it um, with Arts yeah. Effect and the playwright Katie Capiello, where the idea sort of began. Sure. So Katie and I actually founded the Arts Effect back in 2007 um, with this idea that we really wanted to create a safe space for young people to artistically explore their world, as we said. And so our first class actually started with a group of like fifth and sixth graders. So they were like 10, 11 years old. And our first play was called Keep Your Eyes Open. And it was around themes of sexist gym teachers and you know, not learning about women in history class. And then as they got older, it moved into our next play, which was Facebook Me when they were in middle school. And it was about social media and the pressures of social media and how they balance this sort of online world versus, you know, their re real selves offline. And then we noticed a real dramatic shift when the girls were about eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. And they started coming into our class and they were talking about slut shaming and instances of sexual harassment and even sexual assault. And so we knew that this needed to be the theme for our next play. And so all of our classes were structured as such that girls would come into our class and we would sit down and just start talking and open up the conversation by literally saying like, what's going on with you today? And sometimes, I mean, they were three hour long classes and we couldn't even get to the acting parts because they had so much that they wanted to share. We would literally sit and talk for three hours. And so when it came to, you know, devising slut, um, it was heartbreaking, right? It was like really hard to hear um, these young people who we, you know, cared about so much share such um, really troubling circumstances that they were going through, but we also knew that it was just critical for them to be able to have a safe space to talk about these things so that we could process it and then create a piece of theater that would allow really important conversations. And so that's what we did. And so we started then improvising a lot of scenes, um, figuring out, you know, which characters we could start to pull out that would create really strong dynamic storylines. Um, and then Katie and I would talk a lot about which storylines we thought were stronger than others um, and then Katie would go and, and write the dialogue and we would come back and we would start workshopping directly with the girls and it would be okay well does this sound exactly like you would say it or they'd say no we want to cut this we should maybe change this here like they were so heavily involved in the creation process um, and I think that that was really critical in order for the play to feel so authentic and real because it was coming directly from them and their experiences. Definitely. And can you, you mentioned that you started with these, with these girls when they were in fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about engaging high schoolers and middle schoolers and even younger in conversations that are around like sexual violence, sexual politics, um, as opposed to college students who are maybe more um, like used to having these conversations? And um, further, like why tell the story of, of high schoolers and middle schoolers? Sure. I mean, I think that's such a good question. Um, and we get asked it a lot, honestly. And I think the simplest answer is to say it's important to have these conversations with high schoolers because it's happening to high schoolers, right? So yes, of course, people at University of Michigan and like other colleges and universities around the country and even around the world should be having these conversations, no question. But I think the truth is, is that assault and slut shaming and the perpetuation of rape culture is happening on the high school, even the middle school level. I mean, we actually even had a group of fifth graders. One of our plays was called Thought on the Playground that we developed with them because there were fifth graders who were calling each other thoughts. And they didn't even necessarily understand exactly what they meant, what that word meant, but they understood that it could be weaponized and it could be used to put other people down. And so if we're not addressing the reality of what's going on and if we're not having an honest conversation about what young people are going through, then it's gonna continue and it's not gonna stop. And the truth is like, we see that. We created this play actually back in 2013. So before the Me Too movement and the fact that we're still having this conversation that we still have, you know, Governor Andrew Cuomo in my home state of New York, you know, like having all these issues, it's because we're not actually addressing it on a real level. 
Um, and I think the Me Too movement has done job of shedding a lot of awareness around it um, but clearly we still have so much more to do definitely and and working with with actresses so young what what surprised you in the devising process um, given their perspective of of youth and um, like was it difficult to engage them in conversations that are maybe so heavy at times yeah um, no it was not hard <laughs> and I will say that because I think I had such a unique and really special relationship with these young people. I wasn't their parent. I wasn't their teacher. I was an adult figure, but someone who they could feel truly safe with and be able to be honest with in a really protected way. And so it allowed for true authentic vulnerability, um, which I think if you, when you ask about what it was I'm most surprised by, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but I admired so much just how brave the young people were in being able to share so honestly about what went on in their lives. I think it is so hard. Um, it, it is ridiculously challenging for people to speak about these things, but they felt like these stories needed to be heard and, and they really because they had each other too, right? They became like such an amazing close, close group um, that really had each other's backs. So it was amazing to see. And um, let's talk a little bit more about the, the themes that are explored in Slut. Um, one thing that I was first struck by when, when I was reading it was this real dichotomy of the word slut um, being both this really demeaning, hurtful word, but also being repurposed by, by women as this like badge of honor, weirdly, um, or, or not weirdly, but can you, can you sort of talk about this dichotomy of, of sex as power, but also being disgraceful and taboo in women, um, and have slut the play works to like normalize and maybe like neutralize sex in that way? Sure. Uh, it's a really good question. And I think, um, when I'm asked questions like this, the first thing I like to really do is ask why. Right? I think it's so important to try to dissect and break things down and to understand why does this happen. So first part, why do we slut shame? Why do we so often as a culture and as people decide it's a good idea to call, an, usually it's a girl, right? Like another girl or woman a slut. And I think what we found is that the truth is that when you do that, you are othering the person, right? So Joey, who is the main character in Slut, the play who is sexually assaulted, we other her. We say, well, it happened to her because she was slutty, because she engaged in you know, slutty behavior, which then creates, I think, a false sense of security for everyone else because then they can say, well, that would never happen to me because I'm not a slut. I'm not engaging in that type of behavior. And so it really happened to her because she's a slut and it won't happen to me. And it's a way that I can try to create like I just said, like the safety of it, it, it's not possible for me to experience those same hardships. But we know that that's not true, right? We know that that's really a false sense of security. And then the other side of the equation is what happens when girls try to reclaim this word slut and use it, like you said, as a badge of honor. And I think that it makes a lot of sense because if you are being called a slut and as human beings, we want to try to have agency and control in our life, then it makes perfect sense to me that you would then want to try to own that word to get some of that control back, to control that narrative and to say, no, like, screw you guys. Like, this is an empowered thing. Like, I feel good about this, right? So I think the dichotomy makes perfect sense to me. I think it's problematic as a culture. And I think that having these conversations though will hopefully allow people to dissect further their actions and their thoughts when they are doing so. But um, I think it makes perfect sense to me why both are happening. Yeah, and, and going off of that, I think it's only repurposed because it was it's being called to them in a yeah. called to them in a in a horrible way. Um, exactly. from, from that sense, I think issues regarding rape and slut shaming are equally, if not more, important for boys and men to be having. Um, so, how do you see from from your experience seeing audiences respond to this? How do you see um, male audiences respond maybe positively, um, maybe uh, defensively? And how do you think um, men in college and even younger can start having these conversations maybe separate from the play? 
Yeah, I think it is. Um, I'm so glad you asked this question because I think it's a hugely important one. And I think that men and boys absolutely need to be a part of the conversation because y'all are 50% of the population and need to be a part of it, right? And I think toxic masculinity plays a huge role in the perpetuation of rape culture. And so if we don't address it and we don't have men and boys be a part of the conversation, then we're not actually gonna change anything in a real way, I think that's effective. Um, it's funny, I actually now um, have two young boys myself. Um, they're three and five years old. so on the younger end of the spectrum. Um, but I think I've always had empathy for moms of young boys, but now even more so, right? I am constantly thinking about their health and well-being and how to raise them as smart, caring, and empathetic young men that they will continue to grow up to be. And so I think the truth is that boys and men want to be having these conversations too. It's not just a female issue. And so if we give men a chance to also engage in these conversations, they too are walking away feeling more empowered and more in, you know, connected to their peers in a really powerful way. You know, it makes me think about this one time, we had these stop slut chapters that we had created uh, to lead workshops in different high school communities around New York City. And there was one group that wanted to they asked us and they came to us and they were like um you know can we just have one meeting where there's no adults no teachers no parents no nothing it's just us kids and we're like yeah of course that sounds awesome like go do your thing and then report back whatever you want to report back and what they reported back was that at one point uh one of the young women asked the other women who were in the room have you ever engaged in a sexual experience that you didn't want to and every single girl raised their hand and all of the men in the room, or you know, young men in the room were shocked, completely floored. They could not believe that their female counterparts were engaging in sexual behavior that they didn't want to with them and with their peers. And so, and they felt awful about it, right? They were just like, oh my gosh, like this is terrible. Like we need to be talking about this. And so as simple as a question of like, do you actually want to be engaging in this activity right now can have, I think, truly life-changing results. And I don't mean to say that dramatically. I think it's really sometimes as simple as that um, can really change things for people, so. Definitely, and you say that, and I think back to like my high school and middle school years and yeah. never had these conversations. Um, and I, I think these conversations, not even around sexual violence and sexual politics, but just sex in general and, and gender politics is rarely a discussion that's happening in, in like middle schools and high schools because I think it's, seen as inappropriate. Um, why do you think schools are reluctant to be having these conversations and like forums for themselves if, if the ones that you're having off of the play have been obviously so successful? Um, and how do you think it can kind of contributes to this taboo and shaming of female sexuality? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely contributes to the shaming of female sexuality. Um, and I think it sort of relates to what I was saying before about why we slut shame. I think we want to other the problem. We want to say it's not happening here. We want to say that, oh, oh it really sucks it's happening at your school and at your college, but my kids, you know, they're not sluts and rapists. So like, it's okay, it's, we don't have to address it, you know? But it's, it's actually funny, just this morning, I was reading an article about how yesterday, um, the World Health Organization came out with this massive study. I don't know if you've had a chance to see this yet, but um, it's one of the biggest studies of its kind, which is exciting in and of itself. But horrifically, it showed that one in three women in the world will experience physical or sexual assault in their lifetime. One in three. And so when you think about that, you can't other it because it's not happening to in just third world countries. It's not happening in, you know, the other high schools or the other colleges, not yours. It is happening everywhere. It is so prevalent. And so we have to be talking about this and we have to be addressing it in a real way that can create some real change. Yeah. And you, you just said it, the story, this is happening everywhere. Um, and though this is the story of, of a girl from, from New York City, Joey DeMarco, as you mentioned. Um, this play has been performed all over the country. Congratulations. Um, it, was in, it was in New York, LA, but it even went to like Fargo, North Dakota, I read. Um, so how, uh, how did this piece go over in maybe more traditionally conservative areas? And um, 
how have you seen audiences the different these different places relate to it or even like challenge some of the themes um yeah yeah, uh, it's a really good question. We were definitely nervous about it at first. Like you mentioned, we went to Fargo, North Dakota, which feels, at least on paper, like the most different from New York City. And the girls are definitely feeling nervous about it and how they were going to be received by the community. And I have to tell you, like, it was incredible. Everyone, there is differences, of course, in every different community, right? And that's why we always say, you are the experts in what is going on in your life and in your community. I, it's not fair for me to say, I know what it's like to grow up in Fargo, North Dakota, because I have no idea, but I can bring this play to you and allow you to talk about your experiences. And that's exactly what happened. And so I remember after one performance, we always had talkbacks after every show. So we would give the audience a chance to ask questions because it's so much to process. And uh, there was a young woman who was in the audience and she like grabbed her friend's hand. I can literally like picture it right now. It was very powerful. And she stood up and she said, um, thank you so much for doing this. She's like, I now just realized that I was assaulted. And until seeing this play, I didn't know that that's what had happened to me. And so it gave her permission to like acknowledge her truth. Um, so that was a really powerful moment. And then it also makes me think of again in Fargo, after we did workshops with some of the high school students um, and had performed the play, we left. And a couple of weeks later, we uh, get an email from some of the young people who we were still in touch with. And they told us about how it was their prom. And the DJ started playing the song Blurred Lines. And they really had a problem with it. But because they had already had these conversations and because they felt empowered as like this coalition, this like group of young people who were in this together and it wasn't like one single person, they went as a group up to the DJ and were like, you know, we prefer if you didn't play this song, like it feels offensive to us. And they didn't play the song and it was awesome and they felt so great about it. And so it's like little things like that, I think, can also be really powerful. And I think what I also took away from that, you know, moment for them was that as I sort of was alluding to, it wasn't just a single person that had to do that. And what made it so powerful was that it was a group of them. And so with that group, they felt stronger. And that's what I think we need more of. We need to be able to create more of these mini groups that together are gonna say, you know what, that behavior is unacceptable and we're not gonna stand for it. Yeah, and I, I think you kind of got to answering this with the, um, the community aspect of around these conversations. And I know this is a hard question to answer but like how are how would you suggest conversations go about happening in communities that are maybe not as willing to um like put up a production of of, of slut like how do you how do you get these conversations starting in communities that um are like reluctant to have them in the first place i know it's really hard um but i think it's got to start with like one brave person right like it can't be me or you know someone else coming in and saying this is what you guys need to do because we know you have this problem like no one ever responds well to that and that's not fair to say or to do i think it has to come from within so i would just say if you're in a community that doesn't feel supported like see if you can find i mean social media and the internet is an amazing way to connect with others right so see if there's a way to connect with other people so that you can get that strength but then be brave and be bold and, and, and tr start that conversation, you know, take that first step and hold. I think people are surprised, pleasantly surprised that when they do that, actually others feel more similarly than they realize. We all keep so isolated sometimes. I mean, ironically now, even within the pandemic, right? Like we're all so isolated, but yet we are often thinking a lot of the same things if we just have the courage to speak up and say it. Um, and so I think we just have to be brave and we have to try, you know? And you got those conversations starting through um, through through your play, um, and I know that a lot of um, creators and artists are going to be watching the play that's left that's being put up by Basement Arts, but also this conversation. So, how would you, as um, as an activist and creator, um, how do you see art as an effective form of activism? And how do you have any tips for creators looking to like bridge the gap between their art and their activism? Yeah, I think. Obviously, this is something I feel hugely passionate about. I think that the link between arts and activism very naturally happens. But I think my goal is never to be political necessarily. I think it inherently does happen. But I think 
powerful theater happens when you tell the truth. And it's like what Shakespeare says, right? You hold a mirror up to nature. That's our job. Our job as actors is to hold a mirror up to nature, to show the audience what it is really like for these characters on stage. And so if you do that, and if you show the reality, then from that, I think real empathy can start to happen because all of a sudden you're not seeing just this slut that you thought you knew as a one dimensional person, you're seeing her as a whole human being. That's why actually we very purposely have Joey on stage the entire play because we wanted to force people to see her. We wanted you to, in one moment, look at the slut squad and think whatever you want to think about them, whether you think they're awesome and empowered young women or whether you think that they're like slutty and dirty and shouldn't be acting that way. But then at the same time watching that and then also seeing Joey and hear her talk about her sexual assault. And we wanted to force you to, to see that entirety of that, the culture and how it is impacting these young people and then sit with that. And so yes, it becomes political because we want to create change, but ultimately we're just telling the truth. And yeah, as you were saying, uh, the Shakespeare quote that it's holding a mirror, yeah. sure. Um, I think a lot of around this conversation has changed since 2012, 2013, when the play was first being brought up. Um, how do you think um, the conversations around rape culture, victim blaming, slut shaming have changed since 2013, primarily with the Me Too movement? Um, and what, what do you think hasn't changed? Yeah, so I think there has been a great movement because of the Me Too movement, which obviously is incredible and I think needs to have even more energy behind it and continue to have behind it. Like we can't get tired, right, of having the conversations because it's still happening. Um, but the crazy part for me is that actually, I mean, you're asking amazing questions, Andrew. I think they're exactly the right questions to be asking. But honestly, they're very similar to the questions that I got in 2013 when we first created the play. And so it, there has, I think, been more maybe acceptance around having these conversations, but I don't know if enough has quite changed yet because we're still having them and it's still the same type of conversation. And yeah, and given the conversations around um, race and identity with this explosion of Black Lives Matter movement that has happened this summer, um, and the, these conversations that have been happening around the country, um, do you see the intersection of race and ethnicity as now necessary, necessary topics to be um, exploring in relation to slut? I know we have a, um, a Black actress um, who's playing. Um, yeah, so how do you think those conversations sort of factor into the story? I think it is absolutely critical and I'm so excited to, as you mentioned that your Joey is a young black woman and I cannot wait to see how she brings her own experience as a young black woman into the role of Joey and how that sort of shifts and frames things differently because it does and I think that if you had any question of about the fact that it changes things before the Black Lives Matter movement explosion, as you called it, um, now there's, there's no doubt. And so I think it is so important to have those conversations, again, because it's about speaking truth and, and not just on the surface level. Like we have to be able to get down into the minutia of it about how it really does affect different communities differently. And that's the only way that we're able to create real change because otherwise we're just blaming Blanketing it and think that we can create change when it's not going to actually be effective because it's it's too complicated. It's too systemic. There's too many things that um, come into it, and so I think race and identity is critical in talking about slut shaming and rape culture. Great. Well, thank you so much, Meg. Um, this has been an amazing conversation, and I'm so grateful that you um, were willing to give your perspective on the show. Of course, I am so grateful to all, all of you. Seriously, it, it is not, as, as critical as these conversations are, they're not easy. And so really, um, congratulations to all of you. And I'm, I'm so proud of all of you. Yeah, be sure to tune in to see Slut the Play, directed by Alex Lee, March 19th through Basement Arts. Thank you so much. Thank you.